This is our latest stage design build for a church youth retreat we did recently. And this is the new Octo Mark II from Entech that allowed us to make these incredible designs possible across 2000 LED pixels that were connected to this project. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to use this Mark II controller to build something like this for your next event. Welcome to Crazy Amazing Designs. I'm Nathan and I train and educate leaders to do church and event production with excellence. To utilize this Octo Mark II controller for this event, we built this giant F, also jokingly called the Holy F. Look at our giant F. The Holy F! <laughs> Which is the church's youth group logo. The F it stands for Friends, as the church is called East Richland Friends Church. This 3D model is what we used on our laser cutter to score the LED logo on the half inch plywood and then Eric cut it out with a jigsaw. If you're interested in that process, check out that video on Eric's channel because for this project, we actually rebuilt his laser cutter from 1.3 feet by 2.6 feet to just over four foot by four foot, so it's really big. He also built this incredible table for the machine. Going into this event, we didn't have great dimensions of the stage or the room, so when I modeled the design onto my pre-visualization stage, I did a lot of guessing about how large stuff was gonna be. I did have some kind of reference because the last few years we've been there, I took my LED panels and they're eight by 16 feet is the wall size that we used, so I used that to kind of guesstimate the size of the space. I did a lot of guessing though about how large the space was. So while we were there, we took some measurements of the space and we rebuilt the room in Fusion 360. This way we can build stuff in the proper 3D space for the next time that we're in this room. So in the end, the design consisted of a ring with 150 string LED pixels around the edge. Then I wanted to recreate the logo colors on the top and bottom. So we added upper and lower pixels to highlight the logo. Then the coolest part of the design is the 28 pixel strips around the edge of the ring. So 10 of these are Intech LED strips and the rest are WS2812B LED strips. So can you guess which is which and leave a comment? Which pixels are they? The design was such a big hit at the event and people are still reaching out to say how awesome they think it is. Yes, it is complicated, but if you can break down each task that we did into smaller steps, you can complete a project like this simply by completing tasks that make up the final goal. Get yourself one of these NTEC controllers and build something awesome, turning your idea into reality. It all starts for me with connecting the Octo to the network. Every time I think about the content for this video, I can't get over the fact that networking is the most important part of understanding and using these Octo controllers. Everything else is really plug and play and super simple. The network's not that bad either, but still it's really good to understand what's going on. I was looking at the user manual of this Octo controller and I noticed this line that reads, I'm unable to connect to the Octo web interface. So this might be the last section of the manual, but it's actually the first bit of relevance in understanding how to use this controller for your project. All of Entex products that can be connected to the network are controlled through a web page that allow the users to control the units over the network. So if you can't access the unit, then it's most likely there is a network issue. The default IP address of this Octo Mark II, it's actually written right here on the box. It says 192.168.0.10. So when I look at the network settings of my computer, I can see that my Wi-Fi IP address, click details, go to TCP IP, I can see that my IP address is 192.168.4.59, which makes my computer and the network that it's connected to not compatible with the Octo by default. So no matter how I plug it into the network, I won't be able to see or control the Octo. This is because the IP addresses are not compatible. So we either need to change our network to match the Octo, or we need to change the Octo to match the building's network settings. And this is where this question and answer comes in. I'm unable to connect to the Octo's web interface. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect this ethernet cable that I have here to the ethernet adapter on my computer, and then to the Octo, the in port. And now I'm gonna go ahead and connect this to power. Let's go find some power for it. I went ahead and found a power strip to connect up the power supply. So I'm gonna to go to the Apple system settings and now go to Wi-Fi. we can disable that. And now go to network and now I can click on the network adapter. So to connect our computer to the 
Octo for the first time, we're gonna need to go to details on our network adapter and then go to TCP IP and then change our IP from DHCP, from using DHCP to manually. And now we're gonna have to go ahead and change our IP address. So you're gonna wanna change it to 192.168.0. Anything except for 10, right? Because the default IP address is 192.168.0.10. So that one, that's this device's settings. So let's make it dot eleven, for example. Okay, and now I can hit okay. Cool, so now there it says connected. And now if I go over to my browser, I can type in 192.168.0.10 because we want to connect to the IP address of this controller. And there you go, we just loaded up our web page. Now that the network adapter on our computer has the same network settings as the Octo, we can utilize a program from NTEC called EMU. This was designed to manage network compatible NTEC devices. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up this application. And once it loads, I will click settings in the top right, go to the outputs tab, and now I can rescan for devices on my network. And it's gonna bring up a list, and one of the devices on the network I can see here is the Octo Mark II. So if you can't find your NTEC device on the network, this program is a great option. If it's not coming up on the list, click rescan for devices, and then now you should be able to see it connected to the network. So if you do know the IP address of the Octo like we do because we're just setting it up for the first time, I'm gonna go ahead and go to my web browser. I'm gonna type in 192.168.0.10. So we're gonna connect to the device, so we wanna put the device's IP address in. So if you type in .11, which is what we set the computer to, it's not gonna do anything. So now the page is loaded, we can see here the Octo Mark II web interface. And this works because our computer now has the same IP address scheme as the Octo. Remember that the IP addresses of each device on the network has to be unique, but still follow that network scheme. Now that our computer is connected to the Octo web page, we can go ahead and set the device name, go to the settings tab, and I can change the device name to Octo Mark II Studio Controller. I'm going to go ahead and disable DHCP, and now I'm gonna set our IP address to something different. So let's go ahead and look at our wireless settings again. Go to Wi-Fi, I'm gonna turn on Wi-Fi, and now I'm gonna click on the wireless network once it connects. Go to details, go to TCP IP. So 192.168.4.59. So we're gonna set our Octo to that IP address scheme. So I'm gonna change it to 192.168.4. We can keep it at 10. And then the gateway, which is the IP address of the router, I'm gonna change that to four dot whatever it's set to as well. Okay, so now we can go ahead and click save at the bottom of the screen. Save settings. So now if I refresh the page with this IP address, it's not gonna work because this is now configured for a different IP address scheme. So now we can go ahead and unplug the Octo and unplug the Octo from the computer and then we can get rid of this ethernet cable. I now have a new ethernet cable which is coming from the building's network. I'm gonna click plug it into the in, and now I'll type in on the browser 192.168.4.10, and when I click enter, here we can see the Octo. And to confirm that it's the right Octo, if there was more on your network, click identify, and now the pixels light up. It's so much fun seeing the pixels light up, even if it's just an identify mode. So I do suggest putting tape on the front of your controller and writing down both the device name and the IP address for future reference. So that is how you set up a new Octo for the first time. If you're setting up an existing Octo on a new network and you don't know the IP address, then just go ahead and reset the Octo to factory settings. So to do this, we're gonna go ahead and unplug it from power. In my case, I'll just flick the switch here. And on the bottom of it, there is a button that says reset slash identify. Now, if it's powered on when you do this, this is gonna identify all the pixels. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hold it down. You can do it with your finger. It's probably easier with a pen. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and flick it on. When it turns on, the light is gonna be red. And then I'll just let go of it and let that sit there for a moment. And that should be good. Now I'll just go ahead and turn the power off. And now I'm gonna go ahead as soon as it kind of powers off. And now we'll go ahead and turn it back on. Now you can go through the same steps as before to get your device connected to your network adapter on your computer and make sure it's compatible by changing the IP address of your computer's network adapter to the IP address on the box that's default to the Octo. One of our core goals at Crazy Amazing Productions is to provide event production services to churches, ministries, and businesses from lights to sound to live streaming. 
I've been using addressable LED strip with great success. My LED panels are four by eight sheets that connect together to form any size background wall. The wall looks great, but there is not enough resolution to display lyrics. So that's why we built a lyric strip with over 2,300 LEDs on this one and a half by eight foot strip. We use this to display lyrics and even do lighting while it's hung or mounted for an event. Then there are my six foot and three foot pixel strips that are wirelessly connected to the network and are controlled by lighting software such as Entex ELM or Resolu Marina. So if you're looking for something special for your next event or it needs sound or live stream help, send me an email at crazyamazingnathan at gmail.com. So let's look at the wiring and the soldering that we did on this project. If you think this is complicated, you are correct. So let me break it down into sections that can easily be explained. Then you're gonna understand that this big project is really just easy to understand things on a larger scale. So here I have a five volt power supply. I have the octo controller and then I have some LED tape. The connections are voltage in this case. It's a five volt system and then ground. Then signal, which is also called data. Starting with signal, this is how the pixels get the info they need to know when to turn on and when to turn off. I've connected a wire to the data pin on output one of the octo, then I soldered the other end directly to the first LED in the strip, which is directional, so be sure to send the signal down the same direction the arrows are pointing. Let's look at the power needs for these LEDs. This system uses five volt, like I said, so I've soldered the five volt and ground wires from this power supply to the first LED in this strand. Also, the octo needs power and it can accept anywhere from four to 60 volts. I've also soldered a second wire to the pixel that connects to the octo. Ultimately, there are three wires in this system, five volt, ground, and signal. If you wire them just like this, then things should work out just fine for you. On the logo project, the five volt and ground run together in a cord around the edges of the design. This is what we call the central power trunk. Each of the pixel strips connect to this cord that supplies power around the ring. These pixels do pull a lot of power, so there are two zones with one power supply connecting to each zone secured around the back of the logo. Each zone has 14 pixel strips connected, plus the center string lights and the logo highlight LEDs are also split between the two zones. The data signal starts at the octos and moves from pixel strip to pixel strip around the edges of the logo. I had planned to use four pin connectors so that I could have all of the wires connected, secured, and hidden behind the logo. Then on installation day, we would just have to attach the pixels to the wall and then plug them into their spot on the ring. But I ordered the wrong connectors, so I ended up soldering them manually. This means there were wires running from the output of the second pixel to the in of the third pixel, and then out of the fourth pixel hardwired to the in of the fifth pixel strip, and on and on. I connected the tops of each pixel strip to five volt signal and ground to pass everything through from pixel to pixel. There is room for improvement here, but it really did work out in the end. We already have plans to use the same design again this summer for a week of camp. So I'll be making some of these improvements like installing those four pin quick disconnect connectors on each pixel. Two of the pins will be five volt and ground, and then the second two pins will be signal in and signal out. Looking at a new pack of LED strip, each has a pre-soldered quick disconnect on the strip. This way you can immediately connect multiple strings of LEDs together to the controller. If you remove the sheathing on the LED strip, you're gonna see that the quick disconnect wires are soldered onto the LEDs. There is also a second wire soldered to both the voltage and ground pins of the LED strip. These are there so that power can be injected into the LEDs every so often. The connections between each pixel are very small, so it can only carry so much voltage to the LEDs. There are tons of LED tape on the market that you can use with these controllers, but I have found that these WS2812B strips are very good. Entech sent me two rolls of their LED strip. You can see which pixels they are on this graphic right here. I think their build quality is noticeably better and it has excellent peel and stick on the back that is noticeably better than the WS2812B. I think it's weird that they swapped sides with the voltage and ground. The signal is still in the center, but as you can see from the one strip to the Entech strip, that the voltage and grounds are opposite. 
Sometimes if I ruin a pixel, usually the solder pads get ripped off and I need to replace the pixel with a new one. Since I only had two rolls of NTEC LEDs, I had no replacements, which means I had to connect a WS2812B LED as the replacement. This ended up being very difficult because NTEC's voltage and ground are opposite from the other pixels, so I had to use wire to bridge the gaps. They also swapped the connectors so you don't plug the pixels in wrong and burn up a pixel. I guess that is nice, I think. Let's talk about powering these pixels. I already mentioned that the Octomark II can receive anywhere from four to 60 volts. You can power it through the dedicated power port or from either of the two output ports on the NTAC controller. The full roll of this NTAC NWS12B LED strip is five meters long and uses about 11.5 watts per meter. That is 50 milliamps per LED. There's also 12 volt, 24 volt versions of these LED strips with the five volt LED strip, I can run about 150 pixels in length without needing to re-inject power to the system. On each of the pixel strips, I connected them at the top and allowed the power and signal to pass through to the next and the next. We realized when building the four-way LED panels that large wire causes the solder pads to break off of the pixels a lot more frequently. With this project, I pretty much used 24 gauge stranded core wire to connect the pixels to both signal and power. I've even had success with ethernet cable wire, which has solid core 26 gauge wire. The one place you cannot use this size wire is for the power trunk. After we built the LED cross, we learned the concept of re-injecting power every 150 pixels before power voltage drop becomes a really big concern. We started running this larger gauge power trunk throughout our projects that has smaller wires connected to them for voltage and ground. This has solved our power issues and keeps the wire from heating up. Yes, that can happen, not ideal. I controlled this project with a combination of NTEX ELM software as well as Resolume Arena. I used ELM as a media server in Resolume Arena to map and address the pixels. I've messed around with using the ELM software with the Pixel Controller to do some really cool stuff on my Pixel Strips and some different places, so go ahead and check out this footage. For this project, I definitely was able to utilize ELM with the 8 universe license that comes with the Pixel Controller to do some really cool stuff in mapping for the project. Again, thank you to NTech for these great products and for providing this controller. Subscribe to my channel to see future lighting videos. Have a wonderful day, bye.